Uh, good day, my name is Kubas Chigelski, and what I shall be doing is the risk of a portfolio, which is learning area eight. And uh, this learning area is divided into two lectures, and this is part one, and part two will follow subsequently. If you have any questions, you're welcome to consult me via email, and my email address is um, right there. And I'm also available for telephonic consultations on Wednesday between 10 and 12 o'clock. And my phone number is just below there. Uh, the content that we'll be covering in this specific lecture is portfolio return and standard deviation. So this is more of an introduction to the concepts of portfolio return and standard deviation. Although there will be some practice and then we'll also talk about correlation. And uh, that carries on to the second part of the lecture and uh, correlation is important for the purposes of diversification. So we can see this as a introductory lecture to some certain concepts that uh, will be very useful later on. So what you need to know is know how to calculate the expected return on a portfolio. This is opposed to a single asset, which you are now familiar with. And also know how to calculate the standard deviation. And the standard deviation is important because it allows us to measure the risk of a portfolio. So it is a central concept in finance. Uh, then finally, understand the concept of correlation, which will be expanded upon and in the second part of the lecture of this uh, on risk of a portfolio. And uh, we'll demonstrate how it actually comes into practice in terms of diversification by reducing the risk of a portfolio. So before we proceed to discuss the risk of a portfolio in greater detail, there's some key concepts that need to be outlined. Uh, and these concepts obviously relate to the formulation of a so-called efficient portfolio. So what is an efficient portfolio? An efficient portfolio is a portfolio that maximizes returns for a given level of risk or minimizes risk for a given level of return. Uh, although we're not using any numbers, the concept can be perhaps demonstrated as follows. So assume that you have three portfolios. You have portfolio A, you have portfolio B, and then you have portfolio C. Now, we don't have numbers, as I just stated, but uh, which of these could potentially be an efficient portfolio? Well, we can make some assumptions. So let's say that portfolio A offers a return of 10%, portfolio B offers a return that is less than 10%, and portfolio C offers a return that is less than that of portfolio B. However, all portfolio A, B and C each have the same level of risk. So which portfolio offers or which portfolio is efficient in this instance? It is portfolio A. And the reason for that is again, because although all of them have the same level of risk, it is portfolio A that offers the highest level of return. Okay, so the efficient portfolio is a portfolio with the highest return for a given level of risk. Alternatively, it is the portfolio that minimizes risk for a given level of return. So let's say that portfolio A, B, and C each offer a return of 10%. However, portfolio A has the lowest risk out of those three portfolios. Then portfolio A is the efficient portfolio. So now that uh, we've outlined as to what an efficient portfolio is, and uh, we've stated that the efficient portfolio is what investment managers and fund managers might be trying to construct, uh, what we need to do is we need to talk another two, about another two central concepts to the construction of an efficient portfolio. And that is portfolio return, which obviously is calculated in a different manner than the return on a single asset and also the stand deviation. Now, the stand deviation is a fancy word for the risk on a portfolio. So that formula is used to calculate the risk on a portfolio. So starting with the portfolio return, it is the sum of the weighted returns of the constituents of a portfolio. Okay, so for example, W1 here, that is the proportion that a given stock or an asset forms in the portfolio. So for example, if you have stock one or asset one, and it comprises 50% of the portfolio, that W subscript one will then be uh, 0.5. And it is the sum of the weighted returns of the constituents, and that is the return on a portfolio. Now the standard deviation formula, as stated before, this is how risk is measured. 
and uh, I think it requires a little bit more of attention than um, is given here. So let's go into the second slide. So the operative word in the term standard deviation is deviation, and this is central to the elaboration of the concept of standard deviation. What we are doing by measuring the standard deviation, we are measuring the divergence, which is another word for deviation, of the actual outcome from an expected outcome. Okay? Now, the expected outcome in finance, in financial theory, is the so-called expected return. Okay? So there's a given level of return that we're expecting. However, it is very possible that we don't actually achieve that level of expected return uh, in a short term, on the short term basis. Uh, so, for example, happens, what can happen is our actual return deviates or diverges from our expected return. And this is what we are measuring using the standard deviation. Okay? So, actual returns can deviate or diverge from expected returns. And this is what we are trying to quantify using this formula here. So, let's say that you have uh, three returns that you observe uh, over day one, day two, and day three. On the first day, you observe a return of 8%. On day two, you observe returns of 10%. On day three, you observe returns of 12%. And our expected return over those three days is 10%. So what is it that is happening here? Well, on the first day, our actual return, which is 8%, deviates from our expected return. On day two, that is not the case. Our actual return is 10%, and our expected return is 10%. So there is no deviation. However, on the third day, our actual return is 12%. However, our expected return is 10%. So again, there is a deviation. Okay? On day three, what we have is we have a return of 12%. However, we were expecting a return of 10%. So it's a deviation from the expected return. So going back to the formula which I have just circled. Okay? So this is the formula for standard deviation. And a central part of the formula I have highlighted here, it's R, okay, so this represents the actual return less the expected return, which is R bar, okay, and that is squared. The reason why we square that difference is so that we can have this value in absolute terms, okay, so there's no minuses, there's no negatives any longer. Okay, so to demonstrate a little bit further, let's say that our return is 8% and the expected return is 10%. Our deviation in that point in time for that one single point is 4%. So I have essentially applied this and calculated the deviation in one, uh, for one observation. Okay? However, this is just a, simply a part of the formula itself, of the broader standard deviation formula, which we see here on the left-hand side. Okay? And that is the entire formula there, and that is how the standard deviation is then measured. Okay, so it is the sum uh, divided by n, which is the number of observations, minus 1. It is the sum of individual deviations over a given period of time or a number of stocks or portfolios. In order to apply the expected return and standard deviation, more notably to show how these two concepts apply in... Uh, a more a practical setting, I refer you to example 8.10 in your textbook, which is page 314 of the second edition. So you can follow there and you can read there. Uh, what I shall do is read this example before doing it with you and uh, highlight some of the important points. So assume that we wish to determine the expected value and standard deviation of returns for portfolio X and Y. Okay. And this portfolio is created by combining equal portions of assets X and Y. Equal portions, so that's important. It's quite straightforward. That obviously means 50%. So 50% of the portfolio comprises of asset X and 50% of the portfolio comprises of asset Y. Um, and uh, then following on to the second part, I've just explained this above. The expected returns of asset X and Y for each of the next five periods are given in column 1 and 2, respectively, in part A of table 8.7. So this is a reference to your textbook. Um, and you can see that there. I have pasted that on this next slide, so um, I will now give you some pointers on that. And I will also do this example 
or a couple of steps uh, so that you have a better understanding as to what it is happening. Okay, so what you have here is table 8.7, which is the uh, example from the textbook. And what we have is we have five years here on the side, okay, from 2000 and 2014. So these are forecasted returns uh, between 2010 and 2014. Depending upon which edition you are using, these numbers might differ, but that doesn't make a difference. And then what you have is you have the forecasted returns for asset X and asset Y. So... Uh, how this can be interpreted, uh, for 2010, our forecasted return for asset X is 8% and for asset Y, it is 16% and so on for each year. So for example, in 2014, our forecasted return for asset X is 16, whereas our forecasted return for asset Y is 8%. So unlike a single asset, what is happening here is that this portfolio consists of two um, two assets okay so we are using a somewhat different measure and that is our expected return which was discussed early on in the lecture which is the weighted sum of the returns on the constituents of a, the portfolio in this instance the constituents are asset x and y so now let's look at column three and i will go through this again okay so this is the sum of the weighted returns on constituents okay so First of all, if you look here, you have 0.5. We've been told that the portfolio comprises of assets X and Y in equal proportions. So in this instance, if it's equal proportions, we have 0.5 on asset on the return on asset X, which is 8%. So you see that 8% and that 8%. And 50% on asset X, sorry, on asset uh, Y, which has a return of 16%. As you can see, there's a correspondence there. And if you sum up these two terms, these notably, what is in brackets, okay, what you will find that expected portfolio return for 2010 is 12%. And what you then do is you do that for each year. Obviously, these values change as the forecasted returns for asset X and asset Y differ from year to year. However, what you find is that the expected portfolio return for each year is 12%. Okay. Now, in order to find the expected return over the entire period, so you can call this the expected value of portfolio returns between 2010 and 2014, what you do is you sum up the individual expected portfolio returns for each year, and you divide that by the number of periods. Okay. So this is the sum of these returns for each year, in each year, the expected portfolio return, which is 12%. So it's 12 plus 12 plus 12 plus 12 plus 12, okay? 12% for each year, and then we have five years, divided by N, which is the number of years, okay? And that is five. And then what we find is we find the expected value of portfolio returns um, for this, uh, well, the mean of the mean return for each of, for the whole entire period. Uh, in order to find the standard deviation, we apply the standard deviation formula, which I shall show you how to do so next. Okay, so what you see here is the restated table. Again, we have our returns on asset X and Y for um, given years. And uh, as I said, so we've been told that we have uh, equal uh, proportions of each asset in the portfolio. So what we need to do is we need to calculate the sum of the weighted constituents. Oh, sorry, the sum of the uh, weighted uh, returns on the constituents in the portfolio. So, for example, in 2010, we started with 2010. So, this is just a restatement, but I'm just going through step by step. So, this is 0.5. This is the weighting of asset X. Okay, so you have asset X, and there you see the corresponding return. Okay, then for asset Y, again, we are told that half of the portfolio comprises of asset Y, so that is 50%, and the return in 2010 is 16%. So, you see that 16% there. Now, if you calculate that, which is 4%, and you calculate the value in this term, which is 8%, you will find that those two add up to 12%, and that is what you see here. 
Now again, that is exactly what you do for 2011. So again, restating it, 50% uh, of the portfolio comprises of asset X, so that's 0.5, and the return in 2011 on asset X is 10%, and this is what you see. Okay. Then on asset Y, the return is 14%, so that is what you see there again, and we know that the weight is 0.5, which translates into 50%. So again, if you estimate or you calculate the value there, which is 5%, and the value here, which is then 7%, and you sum that up, what you have is 12%. And that is the expected return on the portfolio in 2011. Now for 12, 2012, you do exactly the same thing. So 0 0.5, which is 50% of the portfolio, which consists of asset X, multiply by 12%, which is the return on asset X, in 2012 plus 0.5 which is 50% of the portfolio and that is how much of asset Y we have there so that 50% multiply by the return on asset Y in 2012 so that's 2012 what you have is an expected return on asset uh, on the portfolio of 12% again in 2012 and that is indeed the case for 2013 and 2014. Okay, so that is the same calculation um, and obviously the same principles. So what we find is that in each year, the expected return of the portfolio is 12%. Okay, now what we need to do is we need to find what the expected return over the entire period is from 2010 from 2014. Okay, to do so, uh, we apply our expected return or our average formula, okay, which I outline on the next slide. So now, uh, just a slightly more detailed calculation of the expected return, which is our expected outcome in this instance. Remember, that's quite important for the calculation of the standard deviation, which uh, we'll cover next. So this is our expected return, okay, which is the return in individual years. Okay, so that's our subscript J. That's what's represented as where the individual years are 2010, 2011, 2012, 13, and 14, divided by the number of years as represented by N. The number of years in this instance is five. Okay. So what is that we do? We add up the return or the expected portfolio return for each year, which is 12%. Okay. So here you see these 12%, or well, the return for each uh, the expected return uh, on uh, for each year, which is 12 plus 12 plus 12 plus 12 plus 12. And that gives us obviously 60 divided by 5. And we find that the expected return okay, is 12% uh, for the period of 2010 to 2014. Okay, so this is how we now have found expected return. So next, what we need to do is we need to look at the standard deviation. So now for the standard deviation, uh, let's uh, look at the formula first. So that is the formula we start off with. That was formula two. And again, um, as explained, this term here represents the deviation of the actual return, which is R subscript J, less the expected return. Now, in our pre on the previous slide, we calculated that the expected return, which is R bar, is 12%. Okay. Now, what are actual returns? Okay, that is for 2010, the return we observe for 2010 on the portfolio is 12%. For 2011, it is 12%. For 2012, it is also 12%. And 2013 and 14, it is also 12%. So all these returns that we observe are 12% for each of the years. And our expected return also happens to be uh, 12%. So we'll have a very interesting outcome for this question specifically. So to write out the formula in full and substituting those values, so we have 12, okay, which is 12% less 12, which is our expected return. So this is the deviation for 2010. Now in 2011, we again had a return, expected portfolio return. So that was the portfolio return we observed in 2010 of 12. So hence it's 12 minus 12, which is the expected return. And that is our deviation for 2011. The same holds for 2012 and 2013, where I'm placing the dots on the slides, and then 2014. And that, uh, then that is divided by N minus one, okay? Where N is the number of years that we are looking at. 
in our example, we are looking at a period of five years. So it's five minus one. So what is the result? Well, the result is that as it is 12 minus 12, in each instance, we have zero okay, for our standard deviation in each period. And the sum of these deviations for each period is zero. So this is the answer. So this, what does this essentially mean? So this means that there is no risk in the portfolio. But why is that exactly the case? Why is this the case? It's quite an interesting outcome. The reason why this is the case is because in each year, the return that we observe for the portfolio is equal to the expected return. So there is no deviation between or no divergence between the actual returns that we observe or our actual calculation and the expected value or expected return on the portfolio, which happens to be 12. Now, obviously, this is not always the case, right? If you had differing returns for each year, for example, if the returns were not 12% in each instance, but let's say 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, okay? If there was some kind of spread, our standard deviation would not be zero. But because our observed returns for each year are equal to the expected return, there is no deviation between the actual returns and the expected return. So hence, our risk as measured by standard devia the standard deviation turns out to be. So thus far, we've discussed three central concepts, which is efficient portfolio uh, and, portfo and the calculation of the portfolio return and the standard deviation. And in order to construct an efficient portfolio, what we need to be able to do is calculate the portfolio return and also the standard deviation, which is a measure of risk. Okay, why is that? Because we're trying to construct a portfolio that yields the highest level of return, hence we calculate returns, for a given level of risk, and hence that is why we calculate the standard deviation. Now what we need to do is we need to talk about an additional concept, which is correlation. And this concept is very important, or correlation is very important, for the reduction of risk through diversification. But this is something that will be covered in the next lecture. So first of all, what is correlation? Correlation is a measure of the strength of a relationship between two variables. Okay? The correlation coefficient, the correlation coefficient is the name for the variable that is used to represent the strength of the uh, relationship between two variables, okay? is between minus one and one. In other words, it is bounded. Okay? So it ranges between minus one and one. So it can be anything in between also, in other words, it can be 0.5, for example, or 0.25, or minus 0.5, or minus 0.25. Okay, so it can be any value between minus 1 and 1, including minus 1 and 1. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at three extremes uh, for the purposes of this learning area. So first of all, we start with uh, a correlation of zero. So the correlation coefficient in this instance would be zero. In other words, there is no relationship between two variables. Okay, Two variables are said to be uncorrelated if there's no relationship between the two. Then what we have is we have perfect correlation or perfect positive correlation okay, in this instance. And in this instance, we have the correlation coefficient is one, a positive one. What is perfect, perfectly positive correlation? This is uh, an instance or relationship where both variables move together. Then we have a perfectly, ne perfectly negative correlation, and this is represented by a correlation coefficient of minus one. What this means is that two variables move completely in opposite directions. And below here on these diagrams, what you can see is you can see an example of a relationship where two, ver two assets are uh, perfectly positively correlated and a relationship where two assets, namely assets N and M, are perfectly negatively correlated. Okay, so let's start with perfectly positively correlated assets. So what happens here is that as the returns on asset M increase, the returns on asset M, N also increase, sorry, N, uh, I will say N November and M for Mike. So as the, re as the returns on asset uh, Mike increase, the returns on asset November also increase. And they increase by the same magnitude because they are perfectly positively correlated. This would not be the case if the correlation was still positive but somewhat weaker. So for example, if uh, the correlation between the two would be, uh, let's say 0.9, if the return on asset Mike increases by 1%, 
the return on asset uh, N would increase by, let's say, 0.9% if the uh, correlation coefficient is 0.9 as opposed to 1. Okay? But in this instance, with perfectly, correlated, uh, perfectly positively correlated assets, there is a relationship where a one-to-one -one relationship where an increase uh, on uh, M on asset M in the returns for asset M results in a corresponding increase for asset N. Okay. On the opposite side of the scale, what we have is we have perfectly negatively correlated assets. Okay. In other words, they move in completely opposite direction. So as you can see, if we have an increase on the returns for asset November, we have a decrease in the returns on asset Mike. On the other words, on the other hand, if we have an increase in the returns on asset Mike, what we have is we have a decrease on the returns on asset November. Okay, so that is where I have drawn those two arrows. They move in comp completely opposite directions. And again, it's you can see it as a one-to-one -one relationship. So if the returns on uh, asset November decrease by 1%, the returns on asset Mike will increase by 1%. So they move in complete opposite directions, but they correspond in magnitude. Uh, so that is correlation. This will become quite important uh, when we talk about diversification in the next lecture. So please be mindful of this. It will hopefully become clearer, but more so we will apply it to show how diversification as aided by negative correlation leads to a reduction in risk. So that is all for now. Uh, I, again, I encourage you to get hold of me if you have any questions. You can get hold of me by uh, emailing me and also by calling me on Wednesday between 10 and 12. And my number is on the second slide. Uh, in the next lecture, what we will discuss is we will discuss diversification. And that is where correlation will be applied to show how risk is reduced because of assets being having a different correlation. And then we'll combine to uh, combine all these concepts uh, and uh, have a more detailed discussion about correlation, diversification, and returns. Uh, please be sure to do the homework um, following this lecture and ahead of next lecture. Um, I thank you all. I invite you to um, correspond with me and if you have any questions. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.